Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, every week I have this opportunity to join with you. And we're going to hear a story about someone whose love for Jesus Christ brought them on a journey they never expected. Our guest tonight is Ernie Freeman. And uh, as we're talking beforehand, it's, it's a wonderful surprise that we've got a lot of common friends in the past that we didn't realize. Yes. And it's great. Ernie, wonder, wonderful pleasure to have you join me on the program. Well, thank you. It's an honor and privilege. Ernie's a, a former Assemblies of God pastor, but yes. there's more to your story than just that. Yes. So, so it's great to have you here. Let me get out of the way and invite okay. you to go way back and start us on the journey. All right. Well, I am going to go way back. <laughs> I was born and raised in the Deep South. You know, I've, I've lost a lot of my accent. You can probably hear some still in some words. But well, I know when I first heard you, you said you were from Massachusetts. I was trying to hear for that accent, too. But, there, you know, it's probably a little bit all of, no. all of it in there. No, it was a little mixture now. I picked up bits and pieces along the way. But I grew up in the little town of Moss Point, Mississippi, and my background is the Assemblies of God, so my Protestant flavor was Pentecostal, and that was the church of my youth, my teen years. It was the only thing I knew growing up, growing up there. I, I never, actually never attended even another type of Protestant church. <laughs> so it was that Southern Pentecostal, good people, very fundamentalist, you know, if I can use that word. Uh, my understanding of the faith was really, I must say, kind of built around uh, certain things you just did not do. You know, you know how teenagers are. There was there was something we called the Big Five. In other words, these, these were prohibitions. <laughs> you know, you you no card playing, no going to the theater, no dancing, no smoking. And above all, no drinking alcoholic beverages. So that that was kind of the youth that I understood in the church and the church of my youth, shall I say. Yeah. And I had no contact with Catholics, maybe in the school, but no contact in the sense of talking about anything to do with the faith. Was there, a, was there an overt discouragement from? Yes visiting not just Catholics, but anybody else other than your? Well, not, not necessarily other Protestant churches, but no, we, we would have nothing to do with Catholic worship. So I, I had, as I said, no real contact with anything to do with it. The only thing I ever heard actually about Catholicism was said in a negative tone. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I regret that personally, you know, I'm much much I could have learned, but really only spoken of in a negative sense. Yeah, and well, and, and probably most of the folk in your church didn't know Catholics, never attended the church, never read anything by a Catholic. No. no. So all well, that they felt about the church is this American, uh, it's, it's, it's the yeah. part of the American history of just passing on this anti-Catholicism. Yes, and the things you would hear them say now that I, I've come into Catholicism, I know it, it was wrong. <laughs> what they were saying was in error and used to, you know, certainly discourage other fe people from thinking positively about Catholicism. So, so I then, you know, grew up, as I said, in the image of God. And then I went into the military when I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. so I was very young. And during basic training, and basic training is very rigorous, mm -hmm. certainly was then. You know, very trying, you know, my first time away from home. And then several weeks into it, one morning, a drill sergeant walked into our barracks and yells out, who wants to go to church? Be out front in 10 minutes. Well, I was willing to take any kind of a break that I could get <laughs> from those, you know, exercises from those barracks and be able just to get out, you know, and, and have that kind of a break for an hour or so. But due to my mentality, I just assumed without even thinking that it would be a Protestant church. And you can imagine my surprise and shock when we pulled up to a Catholic church. You know, that big deuce in half, and we all piled out of the back of that truck. And I looked up, and there was the steps leading up, and I suddenly I looked over here, and there's a statue of Mary. And I went into shock. <laughs> I thought, I think, and there's nothing I could do, though. 
you know, they brought me there and they were going to take me back. I couldn't refuse. I couldn't turn around and walk away. <laughs> so I went up the steps into the church. And it was like I entered into a, an alternate religious universe. I mean, that was the way I was feeling. I felt very alienated. And the church was dim. They hadn't brought the lights yet for the start of Mass. It was dim in there. And I smelled incense. <laughs> and I, I was just very confused. And the ma Mass starts and, you know, I'm experiencing this. And I just, uh, I, I didn't know what people were doing. I, I didn't know why they were doing it or when they were going to do it. Yeah. So that, that was my main mentality through this was confusion. But it was something that stuck with me, that, that really entered into my consciousness, was I got the real sense of holy, uh, uh, holiness there, if I can use that word, hmm. uh, that I had never experienced before. Hmm. And I could tell that the people that were there, they had a real sense of reverence, hmm. and a type of reverence that I had never experienced before. I, I was very unfamiliar with, for instance, silence or periods of silence. In worship. In worship, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in the assemblies, it's just very enthusiastic. It's, yeah. m many parts of it are loud. And I had just never seen anything like the Mass presented to me that day. Now, it really didn't change my views of Catholics, but that did stick with me. Hmm. and. It was something, I guess you might say, was a flowering, or a very tiny little seed that was planted there. And over time, my views of Catholics did change in the sense I, I came out of viewing them completely in a negative way to just kind of accepting them as just, you know, they're wrong, but they're okay. You know, I will just let them be over here and let them do their thing, but I'm not going to speak badly about them. And I certainly don't want to think badly about them. I'll just ignore them. <laughs> but one little thing, Ernie, you had mentioned that when the guy announced, hey, I'm going to church, you had said, well, at least it's a break, an yeah. hour break. Where were you in your faith at that time? Had your Assembly of God upbringing brought you to a, a, a good relationship with Christ so that it was an active part of your life when you're in the military? Well, in the beginning, yes. But you do, thank you for bringing up this point, because there's something that, you know, if I may, that I, that I would like to say here near the beginning, is that anything that I'm going to say from this moment on is not meant in any way in repudiation or criticism of my upbringing. Right. And there's so much I owe those people. Right. You know, they introduced me to Christ. They introduced me to the Scriptures. And we don't, my wife and I, we do not repudiate at all. Right. We don't reject. We're very thankful to those people and humbled to them for allowing us to minister in their midst. Yeah. Which is how I feel about my own background too, through my Lutheran Catholic and Congregationalism that brought me to Jesus Christ. Yes. You know, we, we greatly appreciate, eternally grateful. Oh yes. For that. Yes. And so they had planted a deep uh, seed in you that was still there at least in the beginning of your military days. You're, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was. I, being in the military, and this was the Vietnam era, and I ended wow. up there. Wow. wow, wow, wow. And the experiences there created a lot of doubt, you know, really looking at the faith from a different way and not a good way. But I did go through a period then of searching that ended up causing me to reject basic elements of my faith. Hmm. But then when I got out of the military and returned, in my life, shall we say, reached a level of, of peace and calm that I had, did not experience in the military and certainly not in Vietnam, hmm. I began to be more reflective rather than just reactive. Hmm and reacting against what I was seeing and, you know, and calling on God and not seeing what I expected or what I wanted. And that was really the key. He was not doing what I wanted him to do or I expected him to do. You know, he was just, I really think, waiting on me. And I became more reflective. And I, just, I decided to go to college. 
which I didn't have full plans to do, and I went to an Assemblies of God college. And so my faith began to be nurtured again. And I returned to what I consider at that point and what was for me Christianity at that point. I went to uh, Evangel College, now called Evangel University in Springfield, Missouri, and I majored in Biblical Studies. And my upbringing in the Assemblies of God did infuse in me this desire to know the truth, to search for the truth. Now, certainly in my time in the military, I searched in the wrong places, but my heart was for the truth. And that continued, thankfully. Our guest is Ernie Freeman. Um, again, maybe for those that are not familiar with the Assembly of God background, and you said fundamentalism, and, and yeah. what you would mean is, uh, if this is what the Bible says, then this is what we are to do and to believe. Yes. He was very committed to oh, yes. the infallible inspiration of Scripture. Yes. And so going to major in Bible studies, Bible, Biblical theology mm -hmm. uh, uh, at, the, at your uh, college, was really going to the source as far as yes. you as, as Assembly of God yes. would understand. Exactly. That's what I was doing, and that's why I also then continued from the Evangel to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, right. you know, the seminary that we, we shared together mm -hmm. there. And I enjoyed my time at Gordon Conwell. Again, a very, very valuable experience. When, when did you sense a call to the ministry, or were you just going for the studies? I sensed a call to the ministry in about my third year, or beginning of the third year of college. Mm -hmm. And then uh, met a man who then became a professor of New Testament at Gordon Conwell, mm -hmm. and he directed me his influence is why I essentially went to Gordon Conwell. All right. And from there, I went into ministry in the Assemblies of God, you know, sought ordination, began to minister. I taught, in fact, seven years at a Assemblies of God College. And then I pastored for about 14 years right? in the Assemblies. Wow. Huh. Then had ministry outside of it, of the Assemblies for, uh, what you might call independent, you know, Protestants have various levels of ministry and types of ministry. My call it an independent charismatic ministry. I did that for about eight years. What, if you were to describe to, I assume, a mostly Catholic audience, mm -hmm. uh, what sets the Assemblies of God apart from not just Catholic, but other non-Catholic Christians? That would have been the focus of your ministry. What would you say is the distinctive? Well, one of the major distinctives of the Assemblies of God is an emphasis upon the Holy Spirit and being empowered of the Holy Spirit and seeking the gifts of the Spirit, particularly uh, related to speaking in tongues. Sure. You know, it's where we get the word Pentecostal coming from the day of Pentecost. You know, they'd really focus on what happened on the day of Pentecost, particularly the speaking in tongues. That's a central doctrine, one of the major fundamentals of the faith, as they say in the assemblies. And again, it's because that's what the scriptures say, and, yes. and we see that especially in First Corinthians and, and all mm -hmm. the experiences of Acts. And, uh, and I think part of that was looking at the state of Christianity and wondering what's wrong. Well, we mm -hmm. need the rebirth of the Spirit, which Azusa Street uh, <laughs> at the beginning of the 20th yeah. century and, uh, yeah. and all of that movement. Yeah. All right. So I was in the Simmons of God pastor, as I said, and continuing to pursue the pursue the truth, seeking truth, wanting to know it. And, you know, you, you accept the Assemblies of God doctrine, particularly if you're going to be a pastor. You know, you, you sign on the yeah. dotted line, as it were. You say, this is what I believe, and this is what I will proclaim. And I did that faithfully. I did, I did my best. Hmm. You know, I took seriously my ministerial responsibilities. But I recall so clearly the many times before I would step into the pulpit to deliver a sermon, having this feeling, or even in sermon preparation, hmm. you know, thinking, Lord, I really hope what I'm teaching here is right, that this is true, that this is the proper interpretation. And I would step into the pulpit sometimes almost in fear and trembling of what I was doing. Again, as I said, I took this very seriously. Yeah. And you might think, well, why were you so fearful? Why, what were you afraid of? You were proclaiming the Word of God. Well, I think you, you said something very similar to this. When I was stepping to the pulpit, in one sense, I, I was thinking, well, there's another guy two blocks over, 
in another church of another denomination, and he may well be preaching from the same text and may well reach a completely different conclusion from mine. He may interpret it very differently, and yet we, we're supposedly teaching from the same text. Yeah, yeah. and believing that, that the Bible is, to use the word I think we were taught in seminary, perspicuitous. In other words, it, it, it teaches itself. You yes. Know, scripture corrects Scripture. And, and, yeah, it should and be self-evident. <laughs> it, it, it should be. I'm wondering, do you think there were seeds planted in you during your time at Gordon-Conwell? Because one of the problems at Gordon-Conwell, I don't mean as a problem, but one of the, mm -hmm. the realities was there were about 45 different denominations represented. Yes, exactly, there were. Yeah. And you were of, I'm wondering, uh, a, a lower percentage represented at that evangelical school because most of those at our seminary were more Calvinist, covenantal, yes. reformed, reformed, and you were of yes. the more Armenian. And then even amongst the Armenians, you were a Pentecostal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we were kind of looked sideways even by some <laughs> the Armenians because we were Pentecostals. But... I think really it, you can take that all the way back to my youth in hearing the truth in Scripture and then having that seed planted by that very fact of knowing say, this is the truth and this is where you find the truth and for some reason just be, well, I can just leave it to God and say yeah. it was His doing that that desire to know the truth was always there within me even though I couldn't articulated, certainly as a child, I understood that there, there was true and there was false, and I wanted to know what the truth was. But I didn't face it, perhaps as I should have earlier, and I didn't face it at Gordon-Conwell as I should have, mm -hmm. because my desire was to go into the assemblies, and so that was my focus. Mm -hmm. I, re I remain very narrow. Now, I wouldn't have said that then or described it like that, but I was. I was very narrowly focused in preparation for the assemblies. But still there was that desire to know the truth. And then as I began to think, you know, there's another minister right down the street and then there's another one over here. And I couldn't help but reach the conclusion, you know, somebody's wrong. One of us is wrong. Maybe all of us are wrong. <laughs> you know, and that was the thing that was within me. And it created, actually even at the beginning of my ministry, a real sense of restlessness. I mean, I was committed to the assemblies, but yet there was something within me that was very restless and still searching. And the whole time I'm ministering to assemblies, I'm also looking at the doctrinal statements of other denominations. And there were, there were things within the assemblies, even though it took me a while to admit it to myself, that I was having trouble with, the interpretation of certain major issues. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's this little niggling lack of peace <laughs> that was there. And I spent years just searching around and looking at other theological statements, other theological movements, looking for that solid peace. You know, I, I, someone has asked me, well, what about the peace of the Holy Spirit? You have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit brings peace. Well, you know, peace can be defined in many different ways. The primary peace that the Holy Spirit brings is the sense of peace that you now have in your relationship with the triune Godhead. Yeah. You know, the, the peace to know that you're in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit also can bring that impetus. The Holy Spirit can bring that sense of restlessness, I believe. We used to use the word conviction. The Holy Spirit would put you under conviction. I think that was, in, in one way, was what was happening with me. It's, if the, it's as if the Lord was saying, you want to know truth, and you are searching for it. Well, now I'm going to send this little impetus, this little thing of restlessness within you to know, keep searching. Keep going. You will find the peace that you're searching for. But I should say, during all these years, I was in no way looking to the Catholic Church <laughs> for the answers. I ignored them completely. Until one day, I was uh, in another city for a seminar. 
Fargo, North Dakota. And we had a two hour break. So I wanted to walk, I've been sitting for hours, right? So I wanted to walk around and I'm walking the streets of Fargo and I come upon a bookstore. I love books, you know, love bookstores, but it was a Catholic bookstore. And I remember standing on the sidewalk <laughs> outside the door thinking, uh, you know, I'd really like to go in there, but I don't really want to either. I want to look at some of the books. I'm curious, but I don't want to go in there either. <laughs> and I could hear Gregorian chant being piped over their sound system. It's a little bit of it coming out the door. <laughs> you just just remember my say, background, and I'm standing there on the sidewalk. I was going to say one of the different things about Catholic bookstores versus a, a Protestant staff. There's a lot of other stuff in those Catholic bookstores besides yes. books that yes. is like, whoa, do I really want to go? <laughs> Yeah, I, I saw some of those things. There were the rosaries right there, you know, by the counter there. They had the rosaries on display. Yeah, but I did go in, and that was a fateful day. <laughs> I walked into the rack of books. I ignored the other things. I went to the books. First book I picked up was by Carl Keating. <laughs> you know, the fundamentalism and Catholicism. Right, right. Big the yellow book, yep. <laughs> and I began to thumb my way through it. Now, the title really got my attention, and I ended up spending about an hour and a half just standing right there in one spot with that book, looking at that book. You know, and and I can look back now and see all these little, supposedly seemingly uneventful experiences that I had. There were like steps. And that was the first big one. No, oh, that was a big one. And one of the reasons I was even willing to go in that bookstore was the night before. I was in my hotel room, you know, and I'm channel surfing, I'm flipping, looking for something to watch on the television. I came across EWTN. <laughs> and I paused, which I had never done before. And there was some teaching, and I was surprised at what I was hearing. I didn't expect. That, that depth of that teaching or the clarity of that teaching, or in one sense, the honesty of it. I mean, I expected them, you know, to go off on tangents theologically, but they presented the Word of God as the Word of God the way I had been taught and the way I had heard it proclaimed. I mean, I, I'm hearing this clear, solid, if I can say, gospel teaching on this Catholic channel, and I was taken aback by that. <laughs> and then the next day, there's the bookstore, and a Carl Keating's book. And I ended up purchasing the book. <laughs> Why don't we pause there, Ernie, because it sounds like the Holy Spirit is act, indeed, as a good and Assembly of God pastor would recognize, is yeah. convicting you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's pause there, and we'll come right back to okay. it. Okay. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest is Ernie Freeman. Ernie, it's great to have you on the program. Uh, it's not always the case, but in, in this particular case, you and my journey are just so similar. And it just, I love to see yeah. the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. I can relate to so much of what you were going through. I think just to go back a little bit, I can relate so much to the conviction you felt as a mm -hmm. clergyman uh, about, I've got to get this right. Yes. Uh, because Scripture says, it's, Jesus said, it's better to have a mill wheel put around your neck and thrown mm -hmm. in the lake than to mislead these little ones. Yes. And that was what a Protestant minister, a good Protestant minister, takes, understands that's what it's called all about. Yes, and you know, the, the book of James saying, you know, those of you who teach, you're going to be held more accountable. You know, you'll be judged with greater strictness. That, that's that verse also, particularly that one, is the one that yeah. came to my mind so often, you know, as, as I'm ministering and searching for truth and thus wanting to present the truth. 
But then I came across, as we said, Carl Keating's book, and this, he was presenting truth too, but in a way and in content that I had never heard before. Yeah. And I, I'm one of those people who read his way into the church. I didn't have a personal mentor other than those books. <laughs> it was right after Carl Keating's book, I mean, just immediately after I encounter Surprised by Truth, the story of the converts. Yeah. And that one just, you know, it like smashed me in the forehead because these were people's stories who were coming from a very similar couple of cases, almost the exact background I was. And then I encounter Scott and Kimberly Hahn's book, Rome's Sweet Home. Right. And you know, and then his connection to Gordon Conwell. Right. I was, oh my goodness, what is, what's happening to me? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, in, in my encounter with Catholicism, I, I describe it this way, my process. When I begin to encounter Catholic teaching, and uh, perhaps I should preface this by, by saying that encountering the teaching in those books made me realize something that I had been blind to hmm. up to this point. I was the one who said he was searching for truth. But up to this point, I had never read one single book by a faithful Catholic in explanation and presentation and defense of Catholic teaching and Catholic doctrine, not one. And I felt really ashamed of myself at this point. So what, you know, you've missed out on, on all of this. You, you've ignored a whole stream of teaching, you know, in your searching. So I became more open to more books and more teaching. Thus, you know, the, you know, surprised by truth. When you look back on your, your, your so now at this point in your life, you're all of a sudden uh, confronted by this issue you've just talked about, yes. you know, that I'd never really read. As you look back on your teaching and preaching, had you ever passed along opinions about the Catholic Church to your congregation, to your people that were a misrepresentation of the church? With looking I back, did in I, subtle ways. Right. I didn't stand up and deliberately or, or forcefully, loudly yeah. criticize Catholics. But in certain teachings, I knew that I was saying things you know, that, that would go directly against Catholic teaching, particularly when it comes to the sacraments hmm. and how we responded to the Blessed yeah. Mother. And it wasn't, and I remember that too, it wasn't that we had anything particularly against Catholics, that we believe what we were teaching was true. Yes. We just were teaching true. We, we wanted the, the sheep in our congregations to be fed right. And yes. so, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, there's the issue of, of what we were, were teaching. And, um, had you, the other thing I was going to ask, had you ever heard of a Protestant clergyman becoming Catholic? No. No. <laughs> that, that was why, I, as I said earlier, that book, Surprised by Truth, by about Pat Madrid, those yeah. converts. As Carl Keating's book opened the door for me to read about and opened the door of certain scriptural interpretations and teachings. But then Surprised by Truth with the convert stories. You know, the, that really struck me. And, you know, the door, in a sense, swung much wider, you know, for me. And, and as I said earlier, I would describe my journey in approaching these teachings like this. I would say, first, I went to them and I said, I'll read this, but this is not true. But then I went to, can this be true? And then I went to, I don't want this to be true, <laughs> to this is true. Now, some might be surprised by that third step of struggling with the point, I don't want this to be true. You said, well, you were searching for truth. Well, how could you say that? You don't want this to be true. Because I confronted something that I, I had based my whole ministerial life, essentially my whole life within Christianity, on one theological foundation. And now, foundation stones were being shifted around, <laughs> were being changed, some being pulled out, yeah. and others being inserted. And there was a real wrenching, not just intellectually, that certainly, but emotionally. You know, you don't think about, perhaps, maybe others do, but I didn't, how even emotionally invested you are hmm. in the theological foundations of your faith. 
And these were being battered in one way by the truth. And I had went through a period of resisting that. You know, I have to confess that. I said, wait a minute. I can't believe what I've gotten myself into here. <laughs> and I wanted to back away, but I couldn't. I, I just could not. But it did cause me to do something that I do regret. Hmm. It's my one regret in this whole journey is that it took me so long. Hmm. You know, I hear of others, they they're confronted with Catholicism or they're introduced to it and a year later, or two years later, or three, maybe four. No, it took me nine or ten years that I struggled with this. Just advancing and resisting. So, wait, this is too, I can't handle this. This is too much. I've got to just say this because what you've described, Ernie, is what we've experienced in our work in the Coming Home Network for many years. And we've described the stages that people go through. Yeah. We call the inquirer stage where people are just kind of asking questions but not going anywhere. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they get on the journey because they've discovered things they'll never be the same. Exactly. <laughs> and then they get to no man's land. And the no yeah. man's land is, wait a second, this is going to affect my life, my vocation, yes. my occupation, everything I've ever done. And men, can, men, women can be in that for a minute or for years yes. or for the rest of their lives. Stage four is RCIA, but sometimes that <laughs> takes forever. To, you've just described exactly what we've seen happen so many yeah. times. Yeah, your description is very apt to no man's land. You just wander around there. So, and it, as I said, I regret it. It was too long for me. Yeah, what would you say was so one sure. of the biggest issues that Carl brought up that was that you saw in Surprised by Truth and Scott Hahn's books and other books? What was, one, for example, a major issue that was such a major turning point for you? Actually, I, I would say that the two major points for me, scripturally both found in the Gospel of John, John 6 and John 17. You know, John 6 dealing with the Eucharist, we can say generally, yeah. in Jesus' teaching there. I had been so uncomfortable with the Protestant understanding of that for years. And Protestants practice what you know, many would know called communion. They don't call it Eucharist or Eucharistic service or Mass, obviously. Just call it, we, we're going to have communion. The church I grew up in had communion maybe twice a year. I always had a sense, even as an assemblies of God, that this was very important and what Jesus was saying was very important. And Carl Keating then introduced me to something that I never saw. That when Jesus presented his teaching that he said, this is my blood that you have to partake of. This is my body that you have to partake of. And then he was rejected and murmured against and the point that I never saw is he didn't correct them. When they turned and walked away, he didn't correct them. He didn't say, no, no, wait a minute. I was only speaking in metaphors here, in similes. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is all symbolic, which is what I taught. That it was symbolic, what he was speaking of here. I never saw that Jesus didn't correct them. And I know other Protestant ministers did this. I would teach from John chapter 6. I did a, a series once. I went from the beginning of John chapter 1 and preached it each Sunday all the way through the entire gospel. It took wow. me two years to I was do that. Say it, take a, yeah, it would take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I come to John 6, and I wouldn't admit the, the depth of my uncomfortableness hmm. with my Protestant understanding of that. You know, I, I would teach it, and that was when I was really in fear and trembling that, Lord, I hope this is right. I hope this is right. You said, what did you do with your uncomfortableness though, when you, before you were giving the teaching in, in your preparation time? Well, I did what a lot of other guys did. I went to every Protestant commentary that I could find that would help me present something that was clear and could take away my uncomfortableness with this. You know, so th yeah. that's what I would do, yeah. but never a Catholic yeah. commentary. And you felt even though maybe the uncomfortableness remained, you felt comfortable enough to proclaim it because at least I had five, ten other commentators yeah. that are, are okay, I'm, we're here together yeah. on this. Right. 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not alone. I, I've got some others that agree with me. And these are authorities, <laughs> and they're recognized authorities. I, after all, their books are published and you know, things like that. And with John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, I was perhaps more uncomfortable with that hmm. even than John chapter 6. Hmm. You know, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, where what he does is he intercedes for the disciples, and by implication for us. And the main point of his intercession is unity. Yeah. And that was the other thing for me. I, I survey the Christian world, even just uh, Protestantism. There was no unity there. I, I really struggled with that point. Yeah. And that's why the issue of authority was very important to me. Again, I am in fear and trembling about whether or not this is true. So the question really was, well, who has the authority to state, this is the proper interpretation. This one is a little off and this one is wrong. Who has the authority to do that? And that's really what I was doing was searching for the authority to tell me what's true here, what's right. And as I said earlier, I never looked at the Catholic Church, but now through my reading and my study, I'm beginning to. And it's opening up the scriptures to me in a way I've never seen before. I know there's a verse in First Timothy that you've mentioned many times on this program. 15, yeah. yeah. You know, my, as I'm searching for truth, and even as I'm beginning to search in Catholic teaching, I'm doing so with my Protestant interpretive grid firmly in place. You know, it's like I place it over the text that I'm reading. <laughs> and I, I realize that Texts like that in First Timothy would cause the church, the pillar and the bulwark. It's like, I'm, I, I look at that, I, why did I never see that before? What, mm -hmm. That Protestant interpretive grid really caused a kind of interpretive blindness in me. Why did I see that, what it was saying about the church and not just my private interpretation of Scripture? was not the pillar. Yeah. It's not the bulwark, not the foundation. You know, I, without meaning to sound negative, but within Protestantism, I, I, I came to realize, you know, everyone is his own little leader, is his own pope in, in one sense, his own magisterium, yeah. really the way I prefer to yeah. think of it there. I mean, sadly, even in the own, your own history of Assembly of God, and I'm not being critical of, of yeah. Assembly of God, but you know, if, if Azusa Street or that time period was a reawakening to the Holy Spirit, I'm pretty sure that one of the reasons that many said the Holy Spirit was becoming more visible was for unity. Yes. And yet out of that yeah. movement came so many different Pentecostal churches that don't even speak to one yes. another mm -hmm. because of their different understandings of, of whether you can be saved if you haven't spoken in tongues or not, yes. or whether it's just, other. I mean, so all this, where's the mm -hmm. authority yeah. to decide how that interpretation is true? Yeah, I, I began to look further at, at church history as well, you know, and it, and it hits me I'm reading about a church that existed for almost 2,000 years, and the group that I belong to hasn't existed for 100 years. You know, so how can they claim, how can I as an assumed to God person and claim to have authority of this type that can be found in the Roman Catholic Church? So these things are changing my whole world. <laughs> things are happening to me. Was it affecting your preaching? Yes, it became harder. In some ways, it became impossible. I, I hope it's not too shocking to people, but there became portions of Scripture there at the end of things in the Protestant world. There were Scriptures I avoided and wouldn't preach on. Yeah. I wouldn't teach on them. Because again, I took this very seriously. I don't, I'm not boasting here, but I refused to get up and preach and teach something that I was not convinced about, at least able to say, I may not understand it all, and I'm really hoping for the truth of this, but this is what I believe is true. I'm doing my best here. Well, toward the end there, 
There are certain scriptures I couldn't stand up and teach on anymore with that same conviction. Uh, I bet you didn't preach on Luke 1 very much. It <laughs> said that all generations will call me blessed. Oh, I actually, I remember this. I did a teaching on Mary in the last church that I pastored. And I created an uproar. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do, you know, the full-on Catholic teaching of Mary, but I presented Mary in a p very positive way. I, I centered on the fact that how can you call Mary the mother of God? That was my main point. And I didn't really even talk about Catholicism, but I presented that side of it, how it came to, our, to the understanding and how people can say Mary is the mother of God. And that's all I did. And it's created an uproar. <laughs> and people got upset, people threatening to leave, you know, because I had done that. Wow. But that's the only thing I touched on dur during this process. Well, you apologize for taking so long, but I, I, I personally think that was healthy for you. You know, the words in the same way that you were clarifying, is this true or not? Because mm -hmm. you also knew that if you made any move, it was going to affect other people. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, what was it that finally uh, kicked you in the pants to, <laughs> to, to make the final jump? Well, I, I should say this first in answering that. My wife, you know, <laughs> best person I've ever met, best person I know. I did not introduce her in the beginning to the things that I was studying and teaching. I did not go to her and say, here, read this. You know, because that was always my mentality and approach. As I said, I read my way into the church. Yeah. You know. So when I, often when people ask me questions about things, I, in, even in pastoring, people ask me theological questions. I would try to answer them, but I would always also say, here, you need to read this, or this, this, and this. I'd give people a list, or loan books. I had a, you know, I had many <laughs> seminary graduates. I had a big personal library. But I didn't do that to my wife at this time. Again, it was part of my struggle, my being in no man's land. I, I wanted clarity and surety. I said, I'll keep studying, but I'm just going to tell her what I'm doing but I'm not going to insist that she do exactly what I'm doing. But toward the end there, I really began to talk more in depth with her about it and gave her the books that I was reading, pointed her to certain things. And it had take, taken me, as I said, nine, 10 years, somewhere, and I had to think back on it to be more clear about yeah. the exact amount of time. But my wife, she's, she, I just have to say she's more spiritually intuitive than I am. <laughs> she was introduced to these things and it took her a much shorter time. Much shorter. And she just dove in <laughs> head first and just fell in love in one sense with the Lord Jesus all over again in a whole new way. It was so easy for her. I was jealous. <laughs> <laughs> And she was very sincere and is very sincere in it. It was a beautiful thing to see. Again, I'm thinking, why, why did it take me so long? <laughs> I think partially, I mean, I can't answer that, obviously, but from our experience, partially is because you took your calling so seriously. Well, thank you. You know what I mean? It, it's, yeah. it is a calling of God, uh, and it's a surrender to serve mm -hmm. Him and to do it faithfully. and. And to make sure, you know, I, I really believe that's what we see all the time. Uh, some people jump too quickly, I think. Yeah. And some then dawdle longer too. But did you and your wife then come in together? Yes. Yes. We did uh, Easter Vigil 2010. All right. We came into the church together. Now, a beautiful time for us. You said you read your way into the church. At some point before that, had you made contact with priests or anyone? Had you been visiting I did Mass? did somewhat. Yeah, that's an interesting thing you bring up there. I talked to a couple of priests. One, <laughs> bless his heart, as we say in the South, <laughs> this one elderly priest. I showed up in his office one day, and I dumped it all. I wasn't 
realizing what I was doing, but I just dumped it all on him, and I know I shocked him. I did. He, I don't think really he knew what to do here with me, but what, all that I was presenting to him. And I remember his exact words. He says, you're just going to have to learn to live with the tension. Now, he was doing his best, but I didn't say anything to that. Yeah. But inside, I'm thinking, but that's exactly what I can't do anymore. <laughs> I just can't do that anymore. So I continued, you know, a dialogue with him some. And you said, did I go to Mass? Yes, I, I was one of those people who surreptitiously went to Mass and started going to Mass <laughs> and found my home there. And, and more confirming that this is right. You know, and learning about the Mass and what's happening here, what everything means and how beautiful it is, not only what's happening, but the beauty of the truth of the foundation for why this is happening. So in my last years, as I said, as a Protestant was as an independent charismatic minister. And I really taught seminaries, se sorry, <laughs> seminars. Hmm. I traveled around the country and a little in Europe and Canada teaching on uh, spiritual growth. Principles for spiritual growth is essentially what it was and related to things of the gifts of the Spirit. Okay. So I was not pastoring a church that I thus was responsible for every Sunday. So, so you had a little, most more of the time, a little more of an ecumenical environment? Yes, yeah. yes. Still, some Catholic contacts, it was some Catholic students would come to this, those interested in such things as that, but mostly Protestant. But that left my Sundays free. So I could choose them where I was going to go to church. And I ended up going more and more of my Sundays were taken up. I would be found at a Catholic Mass. And that was a part of my process, too. Had you connected with any of the Catholic charismatics, like Ralph Martin and Father Scanlon or any of that group during that oh, time? Yeah. I, I've not met Ralph Martin, but I heard about him and started reading his works, you know, checking on his ministries, Renewal Ministries, I believe it's right. called. Yes. Right. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned him because he was also one who had a great influence yeah. on me coming into the Catholic Church. And, you know, I, 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 as I said in my testimony that I've written up, right. you know, you have on your website. I want, to, yeah, I want to tell the audience that your story was in the January 2013 newsletter. Yeah. So if they go to chnetwork.org, can, they can read your whole story. Yeah. Right. But I, I recall reading, I don't remember who it was right now, but another Catholic author brought up something that I really identify with. And I know the word convert is very useful. And it is descriptive, yes. Right. I don't avoid it and refuse to use it. But what I'm getting at here is I don't normally call myself a convert because I, that implies, even to I think some of my Protestant friends, if you say I'm a convert, I've converted to Catholicism, can imply and does imply to some of them that I've converted to another religion, another faith of some kind, and that's not really what's going on. I've just become reconciled to the church, the true church. Yeah, in fact, you make a good point. It's probably good to mention this on the program that yeah. actually the church discourages us from using the word convert mm -hmm. to describe men and women who come from another Christian tradition in the Catholic Church. So we always use it with an asterisk. It's for want of a better term, because it's, it's, yeah. it takes longer to say they were received into the church than it yes. does to say, well, they're converts. So we, we yeah. recognize that that word has its, has its drawbacks, though we've always used it to refer to this. So that's why yeah. we use it. Sure. But it has Understood. the problems you're talking about. Because yeah. it's just, it's becoming deeper in relationship with Jesus Christ. That's yes. what it's, we're talking oh, about. it certainly is. It, it answered my search, you know, for, for the truth. I, I, that sense of restlessness is gone. And that was so important to me. I embraced the teachings of the Catholic Church. You know, and that Easter vigil when I stood before that church filled with people there and told them that I believe all that the Catholic Church proclaims and teaches. I believe it to be truth. I believe it to be from God. And that was such an impactful moment for me. But in using the phrase, I've become reconciled 
to the Catholic Church. That reminds me of something else. The one thing about becoming a Catholic that I did not look forward to. You know, I approached Catholic teachings, as I said, through reading. Some things I was able to accept easier. Some were more difficult. I struggled initially the most, as many Protestants do, with the teachings on our Blessed Mother. But strangely enough, teachings on purgatory, suddenly I, that just kind of opened up to me and I said, wow, that really makes sense. And that answered some struggles I had about Reformed teaching before and even as an Armenian struggling with the Reformed teaching, now the Catholic teaching says, oh, no, this is what it means. <laughs> anyway, that I just embraced that. It, it, brought such peace to me. But the one thing that I struggled with the most, I wanted to avoid, I actually tried to find a way to avoid it. I said, is there some way that I can get out of this? I just really am uncomfortable with this. And that was what used to be called confession is now called a reconciliation. I thought that's what you'd say. <laughs> I did not want to do that. You know, I. I would ask around and read, say, okay, I'm a Protestant minister. Okay, I'm coming from that background. Do I, is, do I really have to do that? You know, I'm not coming from a pagan background or anything like that. I, I did not want to go to confession. And it's, I think it's like God's sense of humor <laughs> because that ended up being the most profound experience of the whole journey. One of the most profound of my life was that experience of going to confession. I was, I was so surprised. And I come out of confession and, you know, I felt like I was about three inches off the floor, <laughs> you know, just floating around and realizing I am forgiven. <laughs> Understanding forgiveness in a whole other way now. <laughs> I'd understood it, you might say, on one level, now I understood it on a completely different and deeper level. It was such a profound and beautiful thing for me. And I didn't want to do it initially. <laughs> oh, if I could have avoided and gotten out of it, I would have. But it's, again, uh, it's what Jesus said he gave to his apostles in, in John 20. I mean, there it was. Yes. I don't know what you did with that passage when you <laughs> preached through the whole book, but it's what Jesus said he gave the authority to his yeah, I try to connect that to the priesthood of all believers there, and say that we can all do that. <laughs> Let's try and get an email in here. N uh, Nancy from Portland writes, what does Ernie believe are some particular things that would be helpful in dialoguing with our charismatic brothers and sisters to share with them the beauty and fullness of the Catholic faith while affirming the goodness they currently have in their faith life? Uh, I recall again, I'm sorry, I don't remember who said this, you know, I read so much. But I recall someone saying, a Catholic author, teacher saying, we have the largest Pentecostal church in the world. You know, and in referring to the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church has always defended the ministry of the Holy Spirit, has always taught and supported the operation of the fruits, you know, yeah. shall we say, the charisms the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that is not well understood by Pentecostals and Charismatics in the Protestant realm. You do not have to give it up. You do not have to leave it. In fact, if you will delve into Catholic teachings, you'll, it'll broaden your understanding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it'll give you such an appreciation for the Holy Spirit when you look historically at what the Holy Spirit has done in ministering through yeah. other other individual servants and how they have used that ministry to reach others. Yeah. You don't have to leave that behind. Yeah, the beauty of it is, especially when you'll see this in the Catechism, the writings of John Paul II, the writings of, of men like Ralph Martin or Father Cantal Mesa, you'll see oh, yeah. what you're seeing is the authority of the church helping clarify what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12, and 13, and 14, mm -hmm. as opposed to the individual interpretations that are out there with those passages yes. that cause battles amongst the charismatics, which cause many people to back away and throw the whole idea out the the baby with the bathwater when it comes mm -hmm. to the Holy Spirit. Yes. So you have this wonderful 2,000 year teaching of the church making sure that the charisms and the fruits are lost. Yes. Right. 
Ernie, thank you so much for joining well, us for you. this short time on the, on the journey home. Again, I'll, I'll mention to the audience that your full story, if they want to go to the chnetwork.org website, they can find your whole story in the newsletter. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. My privilege. Sharing. It's hard to summarize a whole journey, but thanks, <laughs> thanks for what you did, Ernie. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. What a pleasant time to spend with Ernie and to hear his journey and how the Holy Spirit guided his, his search for truth in Jesus Christ. I do pray that his uh, a courageous move and his courageous telling of his story is encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.